Please get your Bibles turned to Acts chapter 13. As we get started, we're going to continue in our study of Acts this morning. You know, I've been doing uh, preaching for a very long time. And, uh, and I love to preach. I love to study. I love to share uh, what God's Word is. But uh, some weeks are, are just more elevated than others. I, I love this passage. And I didn't think I would. As I started studying, I thought sometimes you look at the pastor and say, what am I going to get out of this? And how am I going to share this? And especially as we're going chapter by chapter through the book of Acts. But as the longer I got into it, the more I fell in love with this chapter. So I hope I can in some ways be able to share it with you this morning. I, I just love the things that this had to say. I love our worship this morning. I was reading this week one of the books that I like to read each day, and it was talking about worship. And worship is a time to remember, especially for the believer. Obviously, it's a challenge for those who may be outside of Christ, but by and large, when you come to church, it's folks that are in Christ. And we need to remember, and I love the songs that we sang, He's the everlasting God. Why is that important? Is that important to you? It is because that means that he's going to outlast my problems. That's a good thing. Everlasting God. He is the God that is the blessing even in good times and not so good times. Is God still God when things aren't going well? He is. We got to remember that. We have to remember that because I think we tend to forget that. Right? I do. And then the last one is the invitation. Oh, come. The, the Bible ends in Revelation with saying that the Spirit and the Bride say what? Come. That's the last thing that it says. It's an invitation to come. So what are you waiting on? It's kind of like when somebody has got a meal all set for you and the smells are wafting to the house and you haven't eaten in hours and someone, someone says, it's ready, come on. What do you do? I'm not that interested. If you are, you're just not human. Because if you're human, you're going to say, where's my seat? And you get there, and if you're like Wayne, you're going to move everybody out of the way. Right, Wayne? No, I'm just kidding. But when you're going to get there, you're going to get as fast as you can. And God says the same thing. I want you to come to the altar. I want you to come where I am. So why are you saying, well, maybe I'll do it later this week. That's why we're here in worship, is to remind us to worship Him. Well, that was a free pre-sermon. It will not cost you a thing this morning. But I, I was just enjoying our worship time, and Derek's reading that so very much. I was thinking, too, isn't it great? A church of our size has such a great worship team that we have. I think sometimes you don't tell them. Let me just, just give them a hand, all right? Give me a while. It's outstanding. I, I really appreciate that so much. Well, I've got a great quote for you this morning that I found this week. I thought, wow, what a quote from one of the great guys that I love, C.S. Lewis. Here's what it says. Throw that quote up there. You can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. Is that not a great quote? You can't go back and change the beginning. But well, where you are right now, you can start and change the ending. When I look at Paul's life, and we're going to look at Paul this morning in Acts chapter 13, that would be a great description of his life because I have a feeling if Paul could have said, Oh my goodness, what was I thinking? What was I doing? Why was I rejecting this Jesus? Why did I even put people to death? Who believed? Why did I put people in jail? I can't go back and change that. But on the road to Damascus, something happened in his life. You know, a heart change. He met Jesus Christ. And as a result, the end was forever changed. And in chapter 13, we have Paul and Barnabas. If you've been following along with us week by week, Paul and Barnabas are really now set out to go on missions. And we know that Paul becomes the greatest missionary that the world has 
ever known. He literally changed the world with the message of Jesus Christ. And here we have, in chapter 13, towards the end of the chapter, we won't read the entire chapter, but they get to a place called Antioch of Pisidia. Now that's not the same Antioch that we saw earlier where Barnabas went and brought Paul down. That's a different Antioch. This is in Galatia. Later on, Paul's going to write a letter to the churches of Galatia called Galatians. This is where he is right now. And he's gone to this, to this place to begin missions work and sharing the gospel. Now, as you look at this quote, the C.S. Lewis, Lewis quote, you know, it's one of those things we can apply to us as well. At one level, this quote from Lewis would be a great mantra to lose weight, wouldn't it? Well, you've ballooned up to 735 pounds, you can't change that, but you can change it right now, start now and change the, that'd be a great one. You know, you put that on your bathroom mirror, or maybe to fix your house. Well, you let it fall apart, but now you can start and you can change the, you know, or run a marathon. Well, you've hardly gotten enough energy to get to the refrigerator, but in a year you'll be a marathon runner. It's, it's one of those things that we can apply in a lot of different ways. You can't go back to the beginning, but you can do something right now to change the ending. But that's not always the case. Because we can change a lot of things. People change a lot of things in their lives. They have a new effort, a new plan, uh, get better circumstances. But the ending is not simply a more successful life and better memories. Why? Because you can't change the ending of your life because the ending of your life, and I hate to break it to you this morning, the ending of your life is death. That's the ending of your life. And you can do everything you possibly do and you will not change your ending. In fact, death is the great leveler in the entire world. Doesn't matter if you're a, a queen or a president or somebody living on the street, hand to mouth. Everyone, great or small, will face that ending. One philosopher said that death is the worm, is the worm in the core of the apple of life. You ever eaten, taken a big bite of an apple and found a worm sticking out there and saying, hey there. I'm pretty sure when you do, you go, and throw the apple out. And that's what happens. Death is that way. And when we look at it, we want to go and throw it away, but we can't. Because that's our life. Philosophers have, have tried to figure it out for you and say, look, especially in our postmodern day, philosophers will tell you, well, it's up to you to define your own meaning in life. Find that meaning, work for it, and it's that's how it's going to be. But the problem is you're going to die. Doesn't matter what your meaning is. In a hundred years from now, unless you're on Ancestry.com, nobody's going to know who you were. Even Disney has gotten into this. And they've given us another way to look at it in that great movie, The Lion King. Remember that song, The Circle of Life? It's a great song. If you look at the words, basically it says, this is what happens. We live, then we die, then we go back to the ground, and we fertilize the ground, and we grow the grass so that everyone else can live. Isn't that great? But you're still dead. And so it's not all that comforting. To truly change the end of the life, you have to get in touch with someone, capital S, who is in control of life. And here in chapter 13, we see Paul, and by the way, this is Paul's very first recorded sermon. A man who's ending, who has changed, and he's beginning to tell people the change can happen in your life as well. That the good news of the gospel can become a heart change which will change the outcome of your life so that death holds no fear for you. It's the good news 
that he's telling to the Jews and the god fearers because he goes to the synagogue and he tells those, this is how he began anyway, and he begins to tell them about what happened and, and, and with Jesus. Now, we're going to look at this sermon, <clears throat> not in its entirety, but we'll take slices of it. I'm going to divide it into three parts. First one is the significance of the sacrifice. Second is the reason for the resurrection and the hope of the Holy One, number three. The significance of the sacrifice, reason for the re resurrection, and the hope of the Holy One. So let's begin in verse 26, Acts chapter 13. And he says, remember he's talking to the Jews here. He says, brothers and sisters, children of Abraham's race, and those among you who fear God, it is to us that the word of this salvation has been sent. Since the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize him or the sayings of the prophets that they read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled their words by condemning him, speaking of Jesus. Though they found no grounds for the death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him killed. When they had carried out all that they had written about him, they took him down from the tree and put him in a tomb. The significance of the sacrifice. Now, if you go back, which we won't, if you go back to verse 16, where Paul begins this sermon, you will find that he says, God has chosen you, the Jews. And he starts out, it's interesting. We could each, it'd be interesting if we made a comparison. If you read through this, this sermon sounds so much like a previous sermon that a fellow by the name of Stephen preached. Isn't it interesting that the first recorded message of Paul is similar to the sermon that Stephen preached where Paul, as Saul, was right there listening. And at that time, he was angry. But when the Holy Spirit got a hold of his heart, he said, that's the truth. And so he starts there. He says, guys, you know, God made a choice when he made you and me to bring the gospel to life. It wasn't because Israel was a great nation. It wasn't even a nation. But he had chosen it out of God's great love. Now, I, I would go back even further. I would go back to creation because when God creates man and woman, it is God's full love on complete display. Because from the very beginning, as God creates us, God also knows what it will cost him to create us. Revelation 3, 13, 8 says this, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, and that's another sermon. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. Now look at this. The Lamb, Jesus, who was slain from the creation of the world. What does that mean? We know that Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem in the year 30 or 32 AD or BC, rather, AD. And, but he's saying from the creation of the world, Jesus was crucified. It means that the reality of God, who has no time limits or restrictions, from the very beginning, he knew before creation was ever started, that in order for us to have a relationship with him, the plan would be he would have to sacrifice his very son for us. That Adam and Eve, even though they were made to enjoy God as his creation, from the very beginning, God knew that we would blow it. And we blew it with the fall. When Adam and Eve said, I think we don't have to listen to what God had to say. Let's take this fruit and let's go our own direction. And God knew that from the beginning. Does that blow your mind? It blows mine. Because if I knew something wasn't going to happen good, if I knew I was going to light a match and it was going to blow up, you know what I would do? I wouldn't light the match. But God likes to match in such a way with creation because he knows in order for them to be created, they will turn their back upon him 
and he will have to send his son. God's redemptive plan begins before creation. And then we begin to see it when it, when it comes to life with Abraham and then the nation of Israel, and then they go to Mount Sinai. You remember when they go to Mount Sinai, Moses has the law, God gives Moses the law, and why in the world the law? To kind of keep him in line? No. Please understand that the law was given as a, as a characteristic of who God is in his holiness so that God's people could be holy. Why do we have to be holy? In order to be, have a relationship with God, we must be holy, for God cannot stand sin. And so the law is given so that we can be holy. The problem is nobody can keep the law. It's impossible to do everything that God asked them to do. And yet God continues to pursue his plan. And then we see the fulfillment. The fulfillment of the plan comes in the person of Jesus, who is God with us and who did, please get that, complete and fulfill every jot and tittle of the law. Absolutely perfect, absolutely blameless, someone who is in full fellowship with God, someone who is absolutely just. What does he do? He dies on the cross in our place. That on the cross, justice, God's recompense for what was going to happen because of our unwillingness to follow Him and God's mercy is met on the cross. Jesus dies for us. The sacrifice was always necessary payment. To, and it had to be paid for us, the guilty party, because we could never or would never pay the cost of love. I love Robbie Zacharias passed away this year, but man, his work still goes on. And look at this quote. This I, I was reading this week. He says, I position the sequence of fact and deduction in the following way. Love is the supreme ethic. Let me stop there for just a second. What does that mean here? It means that when we're created, we're created out of God's expansive love. God loves us before he ever creates us, and he creates us for love. And that's the ethic. That's the moral principle. But where there is the possibility of love, there must be the reality of free will. And where there is the reality of free will, there will inevitably be the possibility of sin. Where there is sin, there is the need for a Savior. Where there is a Savior, there is the hope for redemption. Only in the Judeo-Christian worldview does the sequence find its total expression and answer. The story from sin to redemption is only in the gospel with the ultimate provision of a loving God. Amen. You see that? Man, each one of those progressions or regressions comes to the cross. And the significance of the cross is that if it were not happening, you and I would have no hope for the change as we face death. Amen. Hmm. Well, let's go on. The reason for the resurrection. The people that God had created and curated, the Jews, over the centuries, turned their back upon him. That's what he just said. And crucified him. And that was that. Or so they thought we got rid of it. We're good to go now. But why? Why did they crucify Jesus? Why did they turn their backs and end his life? Well, you probably know. It was, they were looking for and fighting for a different kind of kingdom. Um... If you go back in this time, there's what some people say there was a Messiah mania. They were looking for Messiah all over the place. Are you the one? Are you the one? And if someone came with some leadership and notoriety, they said, this, this is the guy. This is the guy. The expectations, though, was a totally different kind of Israel. A different kind of kingdom. I was reading in my 
daily Bible reading, trying to read the Bible for this year, as many of you are as well. And it was in Zechariah, one of those minor prophets. And I read that, and it just it was like a gong went off. It, it, it was talking about what is going to happen prophetically for the nation of Israel who had been in exile and had been decimated. And when you read that, I could understand how these Jews would say, we need a Messiah who's going to crush the enemy. We're going to be back on the throne. Everything's going to be good. But that wasn't the kind of Messiah that came on the scene. It wasn't power and dominance. Instead, here was Jesus who was meek and mild, who had no power, no wealth, and his followers were poor and needy. How could he be the one? Can't blame the Jews because even his disciples, you remember the, the two on the road to Emmaus? We had hoped he was the one. We had hoped that he was the one. Their kingdom concept, man, this is going to be great. And Jesus now is dead. Verse 30 starts off with a powerful three-letter word. It is, sing it with me, it is, but. But God raised him from the dead, and he appeared for many days to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. Jesus does the total unexpected. He says, but. He didn't die on the cross forever. He is alive. In fact, he's alive in an expected kind of life. He comes back and he walks through doors and he eats fish. Why does he do both those things? Because if he just walks through the doors, he's a ghost. And if he just eats fish, he's just a resuscitated man. But he does both and he's a resurrected body. Something totally different, totally unexpected, totally new. The resurrection... The reason for the resurrection is it is God's exclamation point of Calvary that the price is paid, salvation is real, and it is finished. Amen. Jesus is our receipt. You know, if you go, and we haven't gone that much, have we, to a store? But if you go to a store in the coming months, and you go to a store and you buy something, and you check out, they're going to give you what? Receipt. Now, if you're smart, you put that receipt in the bag. Because if you look suspicious, like Mark does, you know, when you're going through there. Yes. And you're going through there, and you say, whoa, 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 sir. What's in the bag? Oh, it's just shirts and things that I bought. Really? I think you took these. He says, no, no, no. Here's my receipt. And I pay for it once. It would be unjust to make me pay for it a second time. And when we see the resurrected Jesus, God is saying that the price is completely paid. I have made it acceptable and it will not be paid again if you have faith in the just one, Jesus Christ. Hmm. Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. But it is a kingdom that is yet to come. Now, don't be too hard on those disciples. Don't be too hard on those uh, Jews. Because, let's be honest, you and I are constantly working to make plans to build and defend our tiny kingdoms in our world. Do you know why? Because God has placed a longing in our hearts for a kingdom, a paradise deep within us. We want something that makes sense, that we say we're good with that, we're comfortable with that, we're okay with that. And so we try with family, with jobs, with health, with wealth. We do all kinds of things. And finally we get to the end of our lives that it wasn't enough. It isn't enough to make my life worth living. It always comes up short. We say, if only. Can I, can I read something from one of my favorite books from Paul David Tripp? He makes this insightful. 
words here. The cry of the infant who is dealing with pain he doesn't understand is a cry for paradise. The tears of a little boy who's been mocked on the playground are tears for paradise. The anger of a teenager whose iPad has been stolen is a cry for paradise. The frustration of a young professional with a boss who never seems to be satisfied is a cry for paradise. The grief of a man whose body doesn't work as it once did is a cry for paradise. I know that cry. The groan, the, we all groan, and those groanings are cries for a better world. But here's what you have to face. God, for your good and his glory, has chosen to keep you for a while in this broken down world. He has chosen to employ the hardships of this world to complete the work that he has begun in you. He does not leave you alone. He does not leave you without resources. He blesses you with new morning mercies. But he has you right where he wants you. This means your marriage, your job, your church, your family, and your friendships will never be the paradise that you want them to be in this world. But more needs to be said. In his grace, God has granted you a place in paradise. If you're God's child, the final chapter of your story will take place in eternal paradise beyond your wildest dreams. Listen to the words of Jesus. In my, ho my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? As you face the hardships of today, remember that grace has purchased you a ticket for the paradise that is to come. Amen. Is that not great words? Amen. There is a resurrection. Is it real? Do you believe it? Do you see Jesus alive and speaking? That's the reason you have hope and he brings you forward. There's one more thing. There is the hope of the Holy One. Verse 32. And we ourselves proclaim to you the good news of the promise that was made to our ancestors. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have become your father. As to the, his raising him from the dead, never to return to decay. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the, the holy and sure promises of David. Therefore, he says in another passage, you will not see your holy one, your, your holy, you will not let your holy one see decay. For David, after serving God's purposes in his own generation, fell asleep, he died, was buried with his fathers and decayed. But the one God raised up did not decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Everyone who believes is justified through him. For everything you could not do, could not be justified from, uh, let me say that again. For everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. Let me give you four thoughts here. Four words. First is the good news. We proclaim to you the good news. What is the good news? What word is evangelion? What happened? That word, they took it right out of a Greek context and put it in the Bible. <clears throat> what happens in, 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 in regular times, in Roman times, in Greek times, you knew well in advance if your city was going to be uh, advanced upon by the enemy. If you were going to be at war, you knew it well in advance. And so as a result, you would spend all your money reinforcing the walls, getting the men trained, getting your weapons ready. You would spend all your time, effort, and money to do that. But then, if the city before that was to come to your city next, if the city before that defeated the enemy, they would send an evangelion, and they would send it to your city and say, the fighting is over. We have won. What the good news is, is that the fighting is over and that you have a place of security. You can drop your defenses because you have won in Christ. Amen. 
That's the good news. You're saved. But also children. He says that God has fulfilled this for us, their children. When you look at that word children, it implies a home. And for us, a home at last. But not any kind of home you ever dreamed. Because it isn't just you come into a great big building and it is wonderful. But you come home and you finally feel at home. Because who meets you at the door but the loving Father Yahweh Himself. And this means that the longing that you have always had in your heart finds its rest and fulfillment in being a child of God. Let me give you another word. No decay. He says that with Jesus, there is no decay. Now, I want you to understand that's impossible. One of the laws of thermodynamics that is irreversible and indisputable is the law of entropy, which means that everything, everything in our universe is dying. You look at the sun this, this afternoon, it's beautiful outside. But do you realize if, if we go on for millions of years that that sun one day will be extinguished? It's dying. Everything you see, every, the reason when you look in the mirror and you say, where did that gray hair come from? It means you got gray hair. I won't say you're dying, but that's okay. You understand what I'm saying? But when it talks about Jesus, it says he's not dying. He's not getting older. He's not changing. He's getting stronger every day. He is, he says there's new mercies every day. I don't know what it's going to be like in heaven. My mind likes to go to it at times and figure out what it's going to be. But I think if we go to sleep in heaven, when we wake up, it will be better than it was the day before. Because every day the mercies of God are expanding, expansive, growing deeper and stronger and wider and higher. I don't know about you, that gets me excited. There's one word. Justify. Oh, don't forget that word. That everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. That means I stand before God alone, but not alone. I'm responsible for what I do with Jesus Christ. And if I've invited him into my, if I've surrendered my life to him, that Jesus Christ stands with me. And when God looks at me, and get this, he loves me with the same intense love that he has for the son, Jesus Christ. And when he looks at us, he says, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. And it's not because I'm good. But it's because Jesus is good. The just shall live by faith. Those that are justified will live by faith. You understand you cannot be justified by the law. But you are justified by faith in the one who kept all the law. And died for you and placed upon you all his righteousness. Can I give you one more quote from John Stott? Oh, this is a good one. The biblical gospel of atonement is of God satisfying himself, look at this, by substituting himself for us. The concept of substitution may be said, then, to lie at the heart of both sin and salvation. Now, now get this. This is such a great insight. For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, right? Adam said, I think I got this, God. I don't really need you. So sin is man substituting himself for God. While the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Wow. God asserts himself against God. Man, I'm sorry. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrificed himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Man claims prerogatives which belong to God and God accepts penalties which belong to man. Do you see the great substitution? 
that happens at the cross. And the hope of the Holy One is that he says, in my life, you too have life. Now let me go back to that quote we had at the very beginning. You can't go back and change the beginning. But you can start where you, where you are and change the ending. So, let's close with asking the question, what would you change today to change your ending? Well, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you need to change your heart. Doesn't matter how good you are. Doesn't matter how many great things you have accomplished. Doesn't matter how many people think you're good. It is only at a heart level where you have given your heart and recognized your own sinfulness and said, God, I, I come to you with absolutely nothing in my hands, but ask you to give me the gift of eternal life. When there is a heart change, as it was in Paul, it changes your ending. You need to also change your kingdom. Every one of us have those little kingdoms. And when we get ruffled, and when we get a little angry, when we get a little defensive, and when we get struggling, that's God saying, you need to lower the walls, my friend. You need to get rid of the kingdom. You need to look at the kingdom that I have for you and get your sense of worth and hope and ending there. Then you need to change your status. You need to change your status because a lot of times you say, yeah, I'm saved, but look at who I am. I'm just not that good. Here, I just wrote down a couple of things. You need to change your status from being a loser to being a winner. You need to change your status from being lost to being found to being left out, to being invited in, from becoming a failure to becoming forgiven, to feeling unimportant, to understand your God's precious possession. And you need to change feeling that you're abandoned and unloved to being a child and cherished. Every one of us struggle. Every one of us go through things that we just would rather not go through. We're all doing it right now. We need to get our eyes a little higher up so we begin to see the kingdom and the hope. You see, I am going to die one of these days, but death has no hold upon me. I love this. I forget who the preacher was, but he said, when you look at, at that body, I won't be there. That's not who I am. I'm in the presence of God enjoying Life eternal. Amen. That's the hope that we have. Why do we have that hope? Because of the significance of the Savior. Because of the hope of the Holy One. And because of the resurrection. I hope today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, if you are questioning, I don't know if I would die tonight, that I would go to heaven. There's no need to question that any longer because Paul has made it very clear here that Jesus Christ paid it all. Jesus Christ rose from the dead and Jesus Christ invites you into his kingdom even today. Give him your heart. And if you're struggling with other things, begin to look a little deeper and a little higher as to who Jesus is and what he has done and means in your life. All right? All right, thank you for being here this morning and sharing this. I love this passage. I love this passage, and, and um, I hope you'll look at it this week and let God speak to you through the Holy Spirit. Now, let me make one other thought I meant to mention at the beginning. Don't forget, for those that are watching at home in particular, next Sunday, special Sunday, Justin Crow from Chosen Ministries is going to be here with us and share with us some great Old Testament teaching as to how Jesus is revealed, as we're talking about this morning, revealed to Israel, we understand the fullness of that. So be here next week. It's going to be a great time to be able to share that. All right? Let's stand together, shall we? We will close in a time of prayer. So good that I was able to see you this morning. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. Your word is truth. Your word is our hope. 
We don't need to work it up. We just need to read it through. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will move in our hearts so that we'll be excited for who you are and what you've done and how you've loved us and where we're going. And God, that you have us and that our sense of importance is found in you. Our sense of fulfillment is found in you. Our sense of kingdom and peace is found only in you. God, give us yourself all through this week and we'll praise you and thank you in the name of Jesus. In your name we pray and all the people said, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.